here at the Sajiko Cave Hill School of Business and Management, located at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus, we meet the needs of the upwardly mobile professionals. Our business school functions in an evolving global space where the need to have that competitive edge distinguishes you as a professional. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of programs that gives you that edge. We offer our students a doctorate in business administration. Then, there's our executive masters in business administration. Our Sajiko Cave School of Business and Management is for you. Enroll now. So sure. for those of you who have joined us since the program has started, we are talking about COVID-19. We are discussing the threats and the impact. And the first part, we had a very uh, detailed and very informative presentation from Dr. Connell giving us an overview of the virus. And now we are going to have a bit of a discussion where I will certainly share with him some questions that have come forward from our audience. And right off, we have one already where we have someone who's asking a broader question. Okay. They're you want asking, me to take that? Yeah, they're asking about what uh, world leadership is doing to identify and isolate some, some new or renewed contagious diseases more quickly. Uh, perhaps if that's something that you, you can maybe address, and then we can go into perhaps breaking down some of the information that you shared with us during your presentation. Sure. So do you have I, any I really feedback on that question? I do, yeah. And I think this is important because we are experiencing a pandemic now and we think that it is the worst possible thing that can happen to us in our lifetime, but we don't know that. And we could have mm -hmm. several other pandemics. And I am not an alarmist, but certainly the way our climate has changed, the way the behavior of viruses have changed and are mutating, it is not impossible, for instance, in five, 10 years time or even sooner to have another pandemic. And so vigilance is critical. The one thing that we have learned from COVID-19 that must not be repeated is that we need to be extremely vigilant about zoonotic infections or infections that go from animal to man because recently most of these pandemics have been zoonotic infections and so our veterinary specialists or people or zoologists who study these diseases at a lot clo much closer detail they're the ones that are going to play a critical role because by the time they've crossed into man this is, this is already a problem started. The World Health Organization, as well as the Center for Disease Control, uh, both in the United States and in Africa and other centers for disease control, I think are well aware of this. And the earliest, learned, the earliest lesson learned has been, once we get any suspicion, for instance, this cluster of 27 cases in Wuhan, we can't just kind of treat it as a Chinese problem. You know, it, it isn't. It's, it's an international problem until proven otherwise. And I expect, because I have seen a blueprint of it, that there's a, a clear blueprint moving forward, how to trigger, what is triggered when a new virus evolves. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that and that new part, because you did start off talking about this and relating it to SARS, because it is also known as SARS-CoV-2. But it yeah. is described as a novel coronavirus. And so it seems to suggest, and perhaps some of us already know, that there are other coronaviruses out there. Yeah. So what, what exactly is a coronavirus? And so what are some of the other examples out there? And perhaps how you can tell us, how have we been dealing with them previously? Yeah, so I can answer the first, the first two questions. The last part, how, how have I been dealing with them? I don't know because... And I'll tell you why I don't know. We haven't really been testing for them because mm -hmm. they have either presented with self-limited diseases or uh, they haven't presented at all. So the coronaviruses t tend to be respiratory viruses. And so you might have a, a, a flu-like symptom or a cold-like symptom that we think is influenza. How many of you have actually been tested for influenza if you go to your GP? Mm -hmm. No, he, he just says, you know, get some rest, take some panadols. So, it, it, so we never know when we are having a coronavirus exposure or symptom symptomatology. So to directly answer your question, is it, it is novel in that it has suddenly come to light to our eyes because of its mortality and spread. 
Uh, but if it were a symptomatic largely, I mean, think about it, we wouldn't be even having this conversation because it would make a difference. It's not really killing people. So, so, or even if it is, it's not even sending a red flag in terms of mortality spikes. If this were only affecting vulnerable groups, for instance, we could say, well, the 83-year-old with heart failure and hypertension, diabetes, you know, had this flu, but they're elderly and, you know, that's what we expect. But this has flagged our attention simply because of the clustering, the spread, uh, the uncertainty. And so it's a novel virus because it's the first time a virus like a coronavirus like this has come to our attention. Hmm. Now, there's a theory that repeated exposure to the virus increases the amount of the viral strain in your body and ultimately could potentially impact how severe your symptoms may be. Now, is that yeah. true? And does that potentially explain why so many medical professionals fall sick and die from the infection? Yeah, of course, this is an extreme concern to me. And uh, I have to admit, one colleague of mine, when this thing first started, uh, was in a state of panic. Because again, healthcare professionals, we are, ten we are accustomed to dealing with ill patients, but we we're not accustomed to, to being so vulnerable on the front line. And uh, I think that this virus is not unusual in that respect. So we don't know about its immune response, but it seems like repeated exposure to the virus, as you would get for healthcare professionals seeing people over and over and over with coronavirus, or prolonged exposure. So there was one study, I think, coming out of South Korea that showed if your interaction with the patient, even if you had on uh, PPE, your risk of uh, getting the infection was more if you spent more than six minutes in that interaction. So the duration of exposure. Now this, this makes sense because you kind of need a, a minimal dose to be inoculated with to trigger the, the whole infectious process. And so therefore, if you pick up a, a whiff, uh, you know, that's a poor analogy, but, but if you are sustaining, the, uh, uh, sustaining your exposure, then you're less likely to what we call seroconvert. Uh, uh, and, and therefore get, get an infection. Now, as to whether you can be reinfected, I think this is phenomenal because then this would kind of put uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the same category as similar viruses like dengue, where dengue hemorrhagic fever is directly linked to your, pre your prior infection and then your second infection, then you just get this abnormal immune response that can be lethal. Uh, and that is not what we want. But again, that is possible if your immune system is such that that is how it is responding. Most of us should have these antibodies floating around after we've been infected. These antibodies should be sufficient to fight off another infection. But if our immune system is such that if exposed again to this virus, which it should know by now, it then triggers another response then that could be lethal as well. So to answer your question, it might be possible for some of us mm -hmm. to be reinfected and to have a worse outcome, but we don't have that data. Okay. We have a question here. Can this virus be carried in AC units and offices? Do you really? Yeah. Are you in a position I, to answer that? I, I saw the questions. I smiled because I'm an AC person. I mean, I have my AC now at home in my home office, but the I have been a bit disappointed with the way reports have been coming out to the public almost in an alarmist fashion saying, oh, you know, it, it can survive on this surface or it can go, because I'm not sure what that means. So suppose I were to swab the AC vents and I see viral particles. Does that mean that because I'm sitting in the AC room that I am going to be at risk? Or does it just mean that there happen to be particles there that don't, pot, don't cause an infectious risk? And I don't think we know enough about the virology uh, to suggest that because the particles are found on X surface or in this place, that it's necessarily going to convert to an infection. Now, that being said, I think it's common sense practice that if you are doing, for instance, exercise or if you're in a closed space that you open up the space and allow fresh air to come in rather than recirculate air. But that may not be a function of your AC. That may just be a function of the fact that there are more droplets in that environment. You know the story of the choir where several choristers, although they practice social distancing, uh, I'm not sure how you can do that and still be effective as a choir, but they practice social distancing and infected, the infectious rate was high. There's forced exhalation. Mm -hmm. so are you going to say that 
because you got particles in the AC of the church, that that could have led, that's, that's not logical. But I take the point, and I think that one thing that will evolve, as we know for influenza, when it's flu season, there are flu viruses all over the place. And we only get infected if we touch surfaces and then maybe touch our face and or do other things so it's not a problem i think that's what's going to come up with covid19 not now but in the future okay we have a question from a viewer on facebook in the news internationally it is being posited that asthmatics may not be at such a high risk as previously thought is that true yeah i i would accept that and uh, i was i was a bit surprised with the initial reports linking asthma, which is a non-communicable disease as well, and, and, and there is obviously a race difference there as well, uh, to as a, as a risk factor. And I'll tell you why. Asthma affects the airways of the lungs. So the, the, the small pipes as they branch into the lungs. COVID-19 affects the lung tissue. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, we, we thought that it was causing a pneumonia and then, you know, several reports are out there, it causes a pneumonia, but really what we might be looking at on a chest X-ray might not be a pneumonia at all. It might be just these small blood clots that are dotted throughout the lung that look like how a pneumonia might look like, but it isn't pneumonia. That would explain several things. That would explain why the mortality for people who are ventilated, which you usually would for severe pneumonia, isn't that, it's, it's quite high uh, because it's not really kind of getting rid of healing a scar from a pneumonia, but it's really dissolving clots. And there is a lot of talk about whether we should be using blood thinners earlier in this disease. The incidence or, of strokes in young patients seem to be linked to uh, a problem with blood clotting, which is affecting blood clotting in the, in the brain and stuff. So whether we should be using blood thinners earlier. Uh, and, and so asthmatics, I do not think are at an increased risk. However, I would caution you that, that chronic asthmatics are usually taking chronic medication. And if you are taking a medication that in any way suppresses your immune system, then that might put you at risk. Uh, so that would be my comment, final comment on that. Okay. We have a question here as well from someone else in our audience. There is a school of thought that this virus is not respiratory and that ventilators and intensive care units are not necessary. It is felt to be cardiovascular. What are your comments on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that a member of the audience has asked that question because mm -hmm. I have to say that that's my view as well. I think that the lungs are an innocent bystander and uh, there is reason why this virus attacks the lungs. The, the receptors in the cells of some of the lung tissue called ACE2 receptors are actually closely linked to hypertension as well because the ACE2 receptor is part of the whole system that causes our blood pressure to go up by another mechanism. But viruses seem to attach to this and internalize into the cell. I mean, you're really not worth your salt as a virus unless you can get into the cell. So if you can get in, then you can replicate and, and cause problem. This lung destruction is, is there. And then what happens is patients are placed on the ventilator. When you're placed in the ventilator, air is forcefully pushed in, and it, so it takes over your respiration. What also happens is that all of the inflammatory substances kind of get pushed out into the rest of your body as well. So if you have a strong heart, remember you're not just functioning as a lung. You're functioning as a lung plus a heart plus kidneys and an entire organism. But if you have a strong heart, you are able to withstand that period of what I like to call insult or, or the war. If you don't, then eventually what happens is what's known as cardiovascular collapse, where you can't maintain your blood pressure because either the pump isn't pumping efficiently, but then you start it off at a kind of a lower pumping level anyway, or, or, the, or the pipes are not able to modify themselves. Your blood vessels aren't able to modify themselves enough to maintain a blood pressure. And then the ultimate cause of death then becomes these patients going to full cardiovascular collapse and that's how they demise. Whereas if you have a strong heart and a strong cardiovascular system, you might get extreme breathlessness. You may either be to the point where you have to go on a ventilator, but eventually your lungs will heal and your heart and lungs will then function in a unit 
as they usually do, and you can survive. So yeah, I think it's a cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Is that a possible explanation for why there are so many different symptoms with those individuals who become infected with the virus? Perhaps the underlying conditions that may exist or the degree of weak heart or any of those other areas that you've identified may exist in some people, but not in others. And so they respond differently to the infection. I don't think so entirely. I think that is a factor. I think the reason why it's multi-organ or several different organs are involved is that this is an immune response and the immune system affects every organ. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no organ that we have or structure in our body that cannot be affected by our immune system. And that's good because if you want to fight off an infection occurring in your inner ear, you want your immune system to go to, to focus on your inner ear, right? So the fact that it's destructive to several organs, I think is, is an immune phenomenon. And this is what I described as a bizarre immune response or kind of using a sledgehammer to kill an ant. Uh, but the immune system does so very innocently. It's not thinking it's, a, it's an ant, it's thinking it's something a lot more lethal and it's not recognizing it's destroying itself. And there's several diseases like that called autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. And uh, even the blood clots that are forming, blood is a tissue and therefore it's really the immune response in the blood that might be causing these microthrombi that are, that are forming. So I think your immune response is really what's causing this variety of symptoms. And we haven't seen all of them. The gut mm -hmm. symptoms are quite interesting as well. Patients presented with diarrhea and other gastrointestinal symptoms uh, without respiratory symptoms at all. So that's quite interesting as well. Do untested asymptomatic people recover without ever knowing that they have had COVID? Is that possible or likely? It is very possible and it's not a bad thing, except that we need to know that they've recovered and, and this is the role of testing. So. The two types of tests, which sometimes get muddled in media briefings, because you want to know that someone is infected, because you want to get an idea of the spread of the infection. But, mm -hmm. but you also want to know if someone is not infected, that they have recovered. This is where the antibody tests come in. So if you're asymptomatic, it's either that you, well, the three scenarios, you were never, you were never infected, so you don't have symptoms, or you're infected and have no symptoms, uh, in which case you might have antibodies or you have an active infection going on, but you still have no symptoms. Now, again, using hepatitis B as an example, I think the immunology now will become a lot more sophisticated in the months to years going forward. So there are certain blood tests that we can do for hepatitis B and dengue, which can differentiate between whether you are, whether you have an active infection with a certain type of antibody, whether you have a chronic infection going on, but kind of low grade, whether you've had an infection and you now have remaining antibodies, or whether you've been immunized. So the, the sophistication of the immunology is such that it's not just an antibody test. We can actually tell where you are in this whole matrix. And that's important. How is it that we are only now seeing the advent of the stroke factor within the past week or so? I think that's quite easy, actually. Uh, and and it, was, it was beautifully presented by one of our local neurologists here in Barbados, Sean Marquez. You, you only see what you're looking for. And mm -hmm. uh, stroke in the young is, is, is obviously something that is aggressively investigated. Uh, you know, there's a whole set of blood tests that are being done. Uh, the, the cardiovascular system gets investigated thoroughly because young people should not have the sustained exposure to re traditional risk factors to get a stroke. But of course, unless you link coronavirus to stroke, you're not going to even test for it, are you? And especially if these patients don't have respiratory symptoms, and many of them didn't, then you're not even going to, that's not even going to be a factor. The rule in medicine and certainly in internal medicine is, and I also often say this to students, is to cast your net very wide because you never know what fish you're going to catch. And that has happened here because the, the, the net was casted quite widely. We now realize that some of these patients were COVID positive. Maybe we got lucky and one person had a, a strange fever that didn't add up with their stroke, but they were tested. 
And then that causality came in. Now, the same thing that we spoke about where this is probably an autoimmune condition where people are prone to clots is the same thing that's happening to these young people. And uh, I hope that another disease, uh, which was which is predominantly in black people and which was discovered right here by one of our previous vice chancellors, the anti-phospholipid syndrome, Nigel Harris, I hope that UWI will be at the forefront of discovering why these clots are occurring in younger people as well. What's the mechanism there? How should we treat them? Okay. At the start of this outbreak, the WHO said that we could end up with 60% of the world's population being having caught this virus. We are nowhere near that. Without that percentage of infected and recovered cases, can we ever get rid of this pandemic? Can we ever achieve that herd immunity that we've heard about? Right. So herd immunity is, is one of my pet peeves. So some of my colleagues are probably watching this and laughing because it really has a very precise definition that has been kind of stretched because of COVID-19. But herd immunity really refers to your response to a vaccine. And depending on the vaccine and the infection, a certain percentage of people within your population need to develop antibodies to say that the, the community, because that's another, the other term for it, community immunity exists. So for instance, uh, for some infections like measles, 90% of people have to have the immunity to say you have herd immunity. For others, it's lower. For a, an infection like, like, like COVID-19, WHO is predicting maybe anywhere between 40 to 60 percent. The thing is, herd immunity is a function of individuals getting infected and getting antibodies. Now, really, you could argue these measures about isolation uh, and lockdowns, they kind of go against herd immunity, don't they? Because they prevent more people from getting infected. Uh, and initially, and I know some colleagues who said this, so obviously they're singing a different story now. Uh, why not just let everyone get infected and let's just get over this. People are going to die as people die with every infection. Why are we doing all this isolation? The reason we're doing it is because our health system cannot cope with the amount of severe infections. So the, the peak really cannot be managed by a, a health system that's even on steroids, let alone the health systems that we, we might have. And so what you kind of do, you kind of release, then shut off, release, then shut off again. So you allow people to get, I don't want to say get infected, but get exposed. And therefore, it is hope that herd immunity will increase or immunity in the community will increase. The ultimate, the ultimate treatment or the ultimate goal is to get a vaccine. I mean, that's going to cause herd immunity. Even if you're an anti-vaxxer and, and, and you think that someone, um, Gates, is his plan is really just to get this vaccine, uh, and I don't want it. You know what? The herd immunity is going to protect you, so providing sufficient people decide, look, I want this vaccine. I asked a few of my patients, I did a poll recently, of course, I know that some of them are not going to admit willingly. How many of you took my advice and had your flu shot this year? As I don't really know about flu shots because the flu shots are killing people kind of thing. I'm going to take my risk. But I can almost guarantee you when there's a vaccine, and there will be a vaccine, everyone's going to go out there and get the COVID-19 vaccine until superstition comes into it and suspicion comes into it. Like, well, I don't really know. Suppose it's causing autism. I don't really want my child to have the COVID-19 vaccine. I don't even know what this COVID-19 thing is because it wasn't part of my generation anyway. And these are the normal processes that occur in human behavior. Our social behavior will obviously change from some of these things that we're doing right now with the social distancing and so on. Mm -hmm. People may not wish to hug or kiss or greet people. Definitely shaking hands is now off the table. What are your views on how we should be responding to this and how it is likely going to affect relationships? Well, let me just say that, first of all, the, the behavioral change is not all negative. Uh, you know, we may be shocked in this region, but the whole thing about handshaking and cough etiquette and social distancing uh, are things that we should be doing every year during flu season that we don't. I mean, how many of us are obsessive from October until like March about washing our hands frequently? 
and not going to work if we have a fever or a cough or using cough or sneeze etiquette. We don't think about that. You know, I, I often say, uh, and, and hopefully my mom isn't watching this, but sometimes they greet each other and they will admit, oh, you know, I just have a little flu and then they hug. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost as if it's, you know, who cares because the flu isn't killing people like, like COVID-19. And so those behavioral changes are positive. The things that I think we now have to, 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 to relook at, how do we, for instance, conduct meetings where we know that having several people in the room are increasing, are, is going to increase the risk? Are we going to use technology more? How will it affect relationships? There are some relationships that are really on a strain now because husbands are finally discovering their wives because uh, they're at home with them all day long. And, and, and this, this isn't kind of what they signed up to and, and vice versa. And they're saying, well, how is this going to affect my marriage or my relationship now that I have with this person so on? And it, there's a lot of strain. Uh, interestingly, yesterday, uh, one of our medical students said to me, I never realized my parents could be so annoying. Now, obviously, he's in his early 20s, and he, just, he said, but now that I'm locked in with them 24-7, uh, all of these things. The relationship that I am interested in, particularly, is how does it affect the doctor-patient relationship? You know, I had a, I do video conferencing with my patients, and uh, part of the, the doctor-patient relationship is touching people, even if it means, you know, you're going to be okay. I can't do that on video conferencing. Uh, I can say things like, well, you look, you look pretty bright today, or the, you, know, you, you, you look as if you've put on some weight. Uh, it has its positive side. For instance, patients that I can never get relatives to come to the consultation with them, all of a sudden are there in a group chat. Yeah, yeah. So I can say, is he really taking his tablets? The wife is going, no, he doesn't take his tablets. Or is he cutting down on salt and she will just take up what he's just had for lunch, say, look, this is what he's eating kind of thing. So there are positives and the negatives. Suffice to say, the way we did things pre-COVID will never be the same. Uh, it's going to be very uncomfortable for this generation, but it wouldn't be for future generations because this is what the only thing they will know. We have a question here. Frequency, intensity, and duration of exposure increases the dose, but have you seen any data on what the minimal dose that leads to mild or severe infection is? Right, uh, that's a very interesting question. So, so viruses kind of don't behave the same as chemicals, whereas where, you know, the more of the ingested chemical you have, the, the, the more severe reaction you would have. This is a really bad example, but I, I feel I have to mention it because it's being reported out there. Like if you drank, drank a substance like Clorox, for instance, if you had a capsule, it's not going to kill you. If you have a whole container of bleach, it's going to kill you. So whoever said that Clorox should be used to treat, um, you know, this virus uh, probably has never really consumed Clorox. So there's a minimum amount that's required, but that minimum amount doesn't really affect whether you have a mild or severe infection. That's more of a function of your immune system response. So once you get past the amount that's needed, and we don't quite know how much that is, to be honest, uh, we know that this is infectious. Uh, we don't think that you need, for instance, uh, as much as some of the other respiratory infections, but we don't think it's as low, for instance, as chicken pox either, or infection. So somewhere in between there. But once you get that minimal amount, uh, then you will get the infection, but it doesn't dictate the severity of symptoms. Uh, to use an example, HIV. Yeah, HIV is present in saliva. Can you get HIV from kissing? No, because the amount of saliva you would have to ingest is so massive, it's not going to infect you to that, to that degree. There's a lot of discussion about the expectation that there will be another outbreak of this virus later this year, in the winter or the fall. Uh, talk to us a little bit about why that is or may be likely. Yeah. So I think that is entirely possible. In fact, unless this virus is totally bizarre and it has proven thus far to be, uh, then we are likely to have second, third, fourth waves. And every time you have a wave, it, it, it may not be as, as, as steep, hopefully, uh, but it does occur. And when you think about it, 
there is it makes sense so you come out of a lockdown i mean while you were in lockdown you didn't magically develop antibodies or your de your defense system didn't change you're going back out there in a community where despite the best contact tracing someone out there in that community has the virus you're going to be exposed you're going to get it again and so another wave is going to occur because you're going to get an upsurge so vigilance or surveillance that's used in public health, the use of public health terminology, has to be really out there as soon as you see peaks. There's certain conditions that also have to be in place before you can exit lockdown. One is that you have to have a lot of testing going on. You have to know what's out there. And, and there are other more sophisticated metrics like the percentage number of ICU reserve beds has to be above a certain percentage because if you suddenly get an upsurge, you can't have your entire ICU full of people who come in with heart failure and all the other complications. So all those things have to be in place, but it is extremely likely. Now, what is more worrying for COVID-19, uh, and I think the entire health community is worried, our second or even third wave might coincide in the, with the fall, which is flu season. Now you have two respiratory viruses circulating. Uh, Co-infection is not going to be a good thing. Uh, and so this is now a good opportunity for everyone out there that's listening. Uh, get over your myths and concerns or discuss them, I should say, with your healthcare provider and decide that you're going to get the flu vaccine. It is not going to protect you against COVID-19, but it's going to protect you against the flu. And uh, you don't want to get the flu plus COVID. So for the next couple of years, until we get our handle on this, you should be practicing the same public health measures and you should also be immunized against other respiratory illnesses. If for instance, you've had, uh, you fall into a certain high risk category, you should have your pneumovax um, immunization. Or, or if you fall into a certain disease states like sickle cell disease, talk to your doctor about, am I at risk of getting any infection, uh, you know, that I should be immunized against. So those kind of things, co-infection, is never a good thing. And so we are extremely worried about our winter tourist season in the Caribbean, what that will mean. Because entering will be influenza and possibly another wave of COVID. So I'm gonna ask you two questions now about things that we can or cannot ingest and perhaps the impact that they will have. Are there any medications that we absolutely should be avoiding absolutely if we discover that we always suspect we might have symptoms associated with COVID. And then the second one, there's been a lot of discussion about the consumption of alcohol during this time. Ah, uh, yes. Is this driven by any likely medical impact or is it simply the desire to reduce instances of impaired judgment? So what could the consumption of alcohol do to the human person who is infected with the virus? So responding to your first question, although you've said medication, let me just clarify if there's anyone on the, on the viewing audience that has any misconceptions about maybe he said you can take a cap full of Clorox. Bleach is not part of the management. Uh, and, and this is a legitimate question because if you're watching a news item and you see someone in authority saying that something can work, I mean, it is not, it is not totally bizarre to try it. But suffice to say, there's no scientific evidence in that, that that works. Other things that tend to work in terms of their antibacterial effects, like, like garlic, for instance, and ginger, remember that COVID-19 is a virus and not a bacterium, and therefore you don't get those protections. Now, things that you should avoid, because like any viral illness, the one thing that's associated with it is the fever. You should avoid what, are, what is known as the, the NSAID group of, of drugs. So things like aspirin, uh, ibuprofen, uh, or any of the trade names like Advil and those other drugs. I mean, for years, even pre-COVID, we've been advising patients, do not take these substances if you just have a viral infection that you're unsure what it is. Pediatricians especially have advised against this because it's, there's a much higher risk of a complication in kids called Ray's syndrome. And so every parent out there kind of knows to avoid NSAIDs in, in kids if they have a fever and to use paracetamol or panadols. Now, interestingly, a lot of the drug failures with panadols in terms of treating symptoms such as fever and the usual aches and pains you might get with, with a flu-like flu symptom or syndrome is that the drug is usually not taken correctly. Panadols or paracetamol, 
has to be taken on an empty stomach for it to be effective. Most people are accustomed to taking medication with meals. And if you take it with meals, it's not going to be very effective. You either need to take it on an empty stomach or at least two hours after you've had a meal for it to be effective. If you have a fever, do not exercise. If you have a fever, it means that you're in what stage we know as, is known as the viremia. Your immune system really needs time to attack whatever virus it is, whether it's COVID or whatever. And therefore, stay hydrated. So consume water or fluids until your urine is clear and bed rest. Don't try to sweat out the fever. Uh, in fact, the fever should have cleared for 48 hours before you decided to go out there running again. Uh, so there's a myth that's out there. I can kind of sweat out the virus. You, you can't. Your immune system really does enjoy rest uh, in order to fight infections. Now, there, there are lots of promising drugs out there. Some of them have been prematurely described as promising, and therefore they've had bad press, like hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. Of course, that's hard to find anywhere now in the world, such that patients that really need hydroxychloroquine can't get it. Uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, for instance, need the drug because there's no benefit, they can't get it. Uh, there is a lar there's several large randomized controlled trials that are going on using hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, uh, a drug called um, remdesivir, which many of us might not have heard of, although it's not a new drug. It was initially formulated to treat Ebola. Uh, it kind of lost its disease because Ebola is not a problem. So someone said, well, let's try it with, with COVID. And it seems to have preliminary results that are quite promising. There's also interferon uh, that's being used and a substance that's used in, in multiple sclerosis may have benefit. Uh, and then we talked about ventilation and how patients do badly on ventilators because there's this surge of chemicals that might be released from the lungs called cytokines. And there's an anti-cytokine drug that seems to be, be working there. I expect that in the future, in terms of pharmacology, drugs that are more effective blood thinners might also be, have a role in, in, in this disease. I have to say that tr traditional blood thinners don't seem to be working very well, even in these young stroke patients. Something else is going on there. So the pharmacology is exciting. I mean, my word of caution to the public is, first of all, ask your doctor before you're taking any drugs. Whether you heard someone say, well, you know, I heard that this drug works. Don't stop medication either because you think that it, it should be stopped because someone said to you, for instance, stop your antihypertensives. If you stop your antihypertensives, your blood pressure is going to go up. It's going to worsen your chance of surviving COVID, but you're also going to develop heart failure. Okay. So don't start or stop any drugs until you've had that discussion. And we will continue to be guided by the science. The science is moving very quickly. So that's good news. Uh, but ultimately we will find a cocktail of drugs or a vaccine. Uh, yeah. So we have a question here. Aspirin is an NSAID used in the prophylaxis for persons with chronic conditions, but you just said don't use it. <laughs> I was hoping someone would pick up on that. Uh, there is a blood clotting problem associated with COVID. Well, so, so aspirin is used as a, as a antiplatelet drug. It's not strictly speaking a blood thinner. So it stops these substances in blood from sticking together and therefore decreases mortality as a result of uh, in heart attacks and strokes. So you're right, people are on aspirin even if they had a heart attack or they've had a stroke or even if they have risk factors for those things. These are not the category of patients to stop aspirin. So don't stop aspirin if you're on these drugs. However, if you develop a fever or you, you develop flu-like symptoms, you should have a conversation with your doctor whether it is appropriate to hold aspirin during this period. It's a risk benefit because your risk of developing a severe complication if you are on the aspirin might not be worth the, 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 the benefit of reducing your cardiovascular risk protection, which is more long term. So just to clarify, if you are taking aspirin for a chronic condition, like you are at risk for heart attack or stroke, uh, continue taking your aspirin. Uh, but if you develop a flu-like symptoms, please consult your doctor uh, be, because your doctor might, and I advise my patients, you know, hold the aspirin for a couple of days, 
till your fever is settled, and then you can recommence it. We are cognizant of recoveries and infection rates worldwide. Is there any study or indication of any long-term impact on the lungs or respiratory system owing to the adverse impact of COVID-19? Okay, so there are several studies uh, that are ongoing, uh, some of which are in our Caribbean territory. Um, and I, I'm not at liberty to say which ones now because of course, these things are announced by national governments. But suffice to say that the the organs that are affected by COVID-19, not all of them will return to baseline. Now, for instance, the lungs are a good example. Take, for instance, if you've had a pulmonary embolus or a pulmonary embolism or a clot going to your lungs. Over time, you'll be on blood thinners and this clot will slowly dissolve. Your lung status will not return to baseline. There is therefore no doubt in my mind that if there are micro blood clots going to your lung in COVID-19, what is then going to happen is that even with the solution of these clots, the lung physiology would have changed sufficiently that you will have some long-term consequences. And many of these we don't know. For instance, we don't know the long-term consequences on the kidney either. The virus may attack uh, what's known as the basement membrane in the, in, in the kidney, and it might uh, affect how the kidneys function and filter blood. Now, that may not be reversible. Uh, we don't know. We don't know. We don't have sufficient information. But in direct response to your question, most immune mediated illnesses uh, and certainly viral illnesses that are triggered by, by, by organisms like viruses or bacteria, baseline function does not come back to 100%. But baseline function may not need to come back to 100% for you to have a productive life either. But that is something that we will need to monitor. If viruses mutate over time, and clearly COVID-19 has already done so in its short lifespan, how effective will a vaccine be a year from now? And how yeah. will it address the particular mutations at that time? Yeah, so we, we, I mean, we all get very paranoid about mutations and, and, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. uh, but virologists will, will tell you that there's mutations and then there are mutations. So yes, a virus can mutate, but unless there's a significant in its, its, in its genetic shift, then it is likely to be covered, for instance, by the same vaccine or by the same cocktail of drugs. Luckily for us, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 virus seems to be mutating, but not really mutating to the extent where it's really changing the treatment strategy or even the disease response or, or the virology of, of, of the virus. So, so mutations will occur uh, from time to time, but there are mutations that are not significant. Now, of course, we have viruses that mutate from year to year where mutations are significant, like the flu virus, influenza A, for instance, where you're really only getting the vaccine for the previous year's flu virus, and you're hoping that you're getting, you're getting some protection. But the new season um, flu is, is different. It's sufficiently different that the vaccine doesn't cover it 100%. Uh, knock on wood, hopefully this will not be the case for, for, for SARS-CoV-2. I can say that vaccines have also become a lot more sophisticated, such that the vaccine that is likely to be developed is not going to be too highly specific for a particular viral strain, but will more likely cover a collection uh, or a group of, of mutated viruses. Okay. All right, so we've gone over our time for, our official time for ending, but I thought it was a very good discussion and so I didn't want us to have to stop just to avoid that. There are a few questions we haven't been able to get to, but I would like you to talk a little bit as we're wrapping up now about what we can do move, as we move forward in order to put ourselves in the best position to cope with this should we become infected. Now, typically when we get any kind of, of cold virus, we are told to drink plenty of fluids, to eat well, to get plenty of rest. And that's because there is no real treatment for it. What we are really doing is supporting our body so that it can fight off the infection. So what should we be doing now to put our bodies in the best position to fight off or recover should we become infected? 
Okay, so there, there, there. Someone is just reminding me to speak on, on something, so I just want to make a note on it. Okay. But there's there are two clusters that I think are kind of mechanisms of attack for the virus, because this really is a war that we're fighting. One is at a personal level. Mm -hmm. So all of us, for instance, should address our personal health. Don't go out there and try to do a marathon and hey, hope to have the most robust immune system. It's not going to happen overnight, but certainly we should all increase physical activity. We should all eat healthier. We should all try to get, stay on top of our blood pressure and our blood sugar medication and, 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 and try to control our non-communicable diseases because we know whether it's COVID-19 or COVID, I don't know, 24, and hopefully that doesn't happen, then any infection, if we have an NC that isn't controlled very well, is going to put us at risk. So, so that's a long-term thing. Then there are the short-term individual responses where if you're ill at home, don't go to work. Don't infect the whole office because you had to finish that report. You, you have a responsibility to stay at home. Uh, and to get sick leave if you have to, but don't push yourself to go out there. Also, if you're at home, don't try to sweat off the fever. You know, there are drugs available. Take your Panadols, get your bed rest. Don't be at home trying to cycle and say, you know, I, I, wanna, I don't want to put on the extra weight. You know, it's, it's not going to kill you for a few days being in bed, but it might kill you if you're on, the, on, a, on a bicycle, trying to cycle, becoming exhausted, not really knowing anything about your cardiac reserve in an infection, and putting yourself at risk now to, to be thrown into heart failure. So those are things you have to be conscious at an individual level. Now, humans, human beings are, are, are constructed in, in a selfish manner, so we, will, we kind of will get the, the individual things right. The public health measures are probably just as important. So I also have a responsibility to protect you. I have a responsibility if I'm in a public place now to be socially distant. I have a responsibility if I cough, not to cough into my palms and then shake someone else's hand. I have a responsibility not to just go to the supermarket for one cartoon of milk. Because even that movement of going into the supermarket, that's increased movement. I can kind of cluster my shopping list and go to the supermarket only when I have to do so. Or, or, or not just go out because I didn't get my favorite cheese. Do you really need your favorite cheese at home today? Although it's not your shopping day, those kind of, so those are kind of things. You have responsibility to society wearing a mask. People say, oh, well, people could get robbed. Yes, you could get robbed. You could also have crush injury from a seat belt if you're wearing a seat belt. But what you're doing is decreasing your risk. In a motor vehicular situation, you're decreasing your risk of causing serious injury. That's why you're wearing a seatbelt. You might get some injury to your chest, but that's why you're wearing a seatbelt. Wearing a mask, well, it could be used for criminal, criminal activity, but it's also reducing the droplet spread to the people out there. So it doesn't protect you, but it's protecting the public. The public health intervention uh, is one thing that's, it's really the only thing defense that we have. And so I like to say the positives of COVID-19 one positive is that this virus has forced us to work together as a herd because the, the, the herd is nothing unless every member in the herd is kind of working together. And, and, and therefore, we have forgotten that. We've become in our own silo. You know, it's all about me kind of thing. It can't be all about you or not. You too can be at risk. I just want to also end before I close by speaking about one problem in terms of the alcohol because you mentioned it and the alcohol restriction. Now, WHO tends to give health statements about the first thing that comes out is stop alcohol. There, there are probably two reasons for that. One is that alcohol does reduce your immune response. Uh, over time, yes, but also even if you just are at home drinking to kind of calm the nerves, your immune system is not as effective. We know that. It also influences your judgment like you're not going to be, you're not going to know what six feet is if you're intoxicated. You know, all you know is that you're outside and you, you make poor decisions if you're intoxicated or on the influence of any, any drug. I don't think what we have predicted, which we are now seeing in Barbados and I'm sure the other Caribbean islands and the rest of the world is that people do get alcohol withdrawal and it's a serious syndrome and that too can be lethal. Uh, not to say that 
everyone out there is not about there and say, well, you know, I don't want to get alcohol withdrawal because we're not all at risk. But people who drink heavy quantities of alcohol when you suddenly stop will get alcohol withdrawal to the extent they have to come to the emergency room, they have to get a drip, they might have to go to an ICU, and some of them might die as well. And so these restrictions might have triggered more presentations of alcohol withdrawal. And I don't think that's unexpected. Now, how you manage that as a government or as a, uh, in, in legislating, I don't think that it is justified to say for the, the population who might experience withdrawals, we're going to put everyone at risk in terms of their immune response, in terms of their decision making, by saying, okay, let's not stop alcohol. I mean, that's not what you would do. No, the restrictions have been lifted in terms of purchasing. Uh, and I know many people are already starting the engines, getting ready for Monday. Uh, but again, you should be socially responsible at home. Don't drink until you're, you're intoxicated. Don't have alcohol, stay within your safe limits. If you are at home and you have a fever, don't drink alcohol. In fact, don't drink alcohol for 48 hours after the fever has, has subsided. Uh, if you're taking any medications, don't take them with alcohol. Uh, those are kind of things best practice. But in COVID-19 landscape, it could mean the difference between life or death. All right, thank you very much. Very good response, a very clear response to explain perhaps why that has been one of the guidelines that we have had. And for some people, they've seen it as, as a really painful thing that they had to endure during the, the lockdown thus far. And thank you very much for joining us today. You certainly have provided us with a lot of information and a lot that we can digest and perhaps continue to read upon, do our research and get more information about. Well, thank you very much for having me, and I look forward to being back on your program to talk about the success of the COVID-19 vaccine. Absolutely. We are all looking forward to that. <laughs> so thank you, our audience, as well, for joining us today. Our topic has been COVID-19, discussing the virus, threats, and impact. Our panelist was Dr. Kenneth Connell, and I am Marjorie Wharton. For more information on the Sajikor Cavehill School of Business or our programs, please visit our website, uwichsb.org. Keep the conversation going on our Facebook page and reach out to us if you have any additional questions or you require additional information. Hopefully, you will also be able to join us next week when we will be discussing the topic, Digital Economies, Strategies for Pivoting Businesses. I look forward to seeing you then. Stay safe, stay sane, and enjoy the rest of your day. Here at the Sajiko Cave Hill School of Business and Management, located at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill Campus, we meet the needs of the upwardly mobile professionals. Our business school functions in an evolving global space where the need to have that competitive edge distinguishes you as a professional. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of programs that gives you that edge. We offer our students a doctorate in business administration. Then, there's our executive masters in business administration. Our Sajiko Cave Hill School of Business and Management is for you. Enroll now.